Okay, earlier I mentioned there was going to be a question and answer session. Some of those questions will come from things that we think would be interesting to you and that might advance what Don Baker has to say. Others are going to come from a couple of students here at Savannah High School. I want to introduce them. Maya Jackson, would you stand for just a moment? Maya Jackson, currently a junior here at Savannah High School. Journalism, broadcasting are careers that you are considering right now, I believe. And uh, you're always uh, looking ahead. And Maya has achieved uh, uh, her status as an active member of her journalism class. In that class, she has helped lead the yearbook committee during her sophomore year, in fact. Maya also was part of the Blue Jacket broadcasting team. You probably heard her, you probably saw her during your morning announcements. Christopher Bonds, would you stand, please? Christopher Bonds is a junior and currently serves as the vice president of Savannah High School's Student Council. His first career goal is to pursue a career in music, correct? Your second career goal, always good to have a backup, is a career in broadcast journalism. And we appreciate all of you being up here as well, a little bit later, after we hear from Dawn, to ask some what we think will be totally questions. We are here, as you know, to honor a native Georgian, someone who understands that to get what you want, you really do have to work for it. And to keep what you want, you've got to give a little of it back. Everyone who has worked with Don Baker over the years has probably worked with her a little bit longer than I have. No question about it, but I bet not one of them understands better the value of a citizen, a broadcaster, a daughter, as well as a friend, the way I do. Dawn Baker has been recognized in just about every local journalistic organization and community organization, not only for her journalism, her reporting, uh, but also her community involvement with titles like Best Local TV Anchor and Woman of the Year. If I name them all, Don, I'm sorry we'll be here till Sunday, so I'm going to hold off on that. But let me say this before I give Dawn a chance to espouse her wisdom on you, the future of not only this community, but of this great country. To me personally, Dawn Baker is one of those individuals whose drive and determination seem boundless. You don't see that in a lot of people these days. I hope we see it in all of you. She knows exactly who she is. She's very comfortable in her own skin. So comfortable, in fact, that when she's around you, you feel more comfortable in your own. Don will be the first to tell you she's made mistakes, but I bet you she's made very few of them twice. Ladies and gentlemen, someone who can teach you something or two about success is Don Baker. For longer than all of you all have been alive, I'm a proud graduate of Savannah High School, home of the Blue Jackets. It may not seem like it now, but this is the stepping stone to amazing places that you will all go in your life. If you do well here, set your goals high, work hard, and never give up, I promise you that the world really can be yours. This is my senior memory book. Way back in 1984, right here on this page, I wrote that my goals were to become a TV news reporter and anchor. That's exactly what I did in the time period in which I said I would do it. So here's your first lesson. There is something very powerful about writing down your goals. The first opportunity that you have today, I want you to write down your goals and post them in a prominent place and read them aloud every day. Since graduating from Savannah High School and Howard University, I've been working in my dream career ever since. I've traveled as far away as Ghana, Nigeria, and Guatemala to produce award-winning documentaries in those developing nations. And I've been honored with several Emmy and Associated Press awards for best series reporting, best newscast, and best documentary. None of that would have been possible if it weren't for my phenomenal mom and family who supported me from the time I was born and told me that there was nothing I couldn't do if I always did my best, studied hard, got a good education, set my goals high, and believed in myself. All of those tips went into building my strong foundation, which was further nurtured and cultivated in the Liberty and Chatham County Public School systems. Being a student at Savannah High School was an amazing time for me. I wanted to be outstanding for all of you. When you're much older, like I am, you will reflect upon your memories of sitting in this auditorium or in a classroom or walking in the halls, and you're going to realize that these were the very best times of your life. It is extremely important that you don't waste one more second of that precious time and start taking your lives very seriously today. Develop your plan for success. Set your goals high and never allow anyone to get in your way of what your heart desires. It will not be easy, but follow your heart. 
with hard work, sacrifice, determination, a great education, faith in yourself, and the commitment to become the very best you can be, all things are possible. After more than 25 years on the job, I still love what I do and could not imagine doing anything else. I am truly blessed. I want everyone here today to look back on your lives and feel the same way that I do. I'm asking all of you to do me a favor right now. Please watch this challenge from Richard Williams that has gone viral. I hope it will inspire you the same way it has inspired me. Hey, I don't care who you are, what race, what age, what gender. I don't care about any of that stuff. But what I do know is that you have a dream inside of you. And that dream you have kept hidden from the world. You've made excuses for it. You've delayed it. You've listened to people telling you to be realistic. But deep down in your heart, you know that you're not living to your potential. And life is now something you're just getting on with. I want to lay some, some reality on you real quick. Where is the wealthiest place in the world? Do you know? It's not China. It's not Dubai. It's the graveyard. Because in the graveyard, you will find inventions never invented. Business is never erected. Songs never sung, books never written, ideas never nurtured, people never realized because they were scared to take a risk. Scared like you. But you wanna know something else? You're not in a graveyard yet. And every, we get one life, right? And every passing moment, we will never get back again. You will never start this video with the same perspective you had when you click play. You will never brush your teeth the same way twice in your life. Ain't no rewind button on life. I will never get that breath back ever again. See, this present moment is so precious. We have to be here. We have to be in it and make the most of it. We have to live our dreams now because they are possible. 6,000 years ago, Man created the wheel only 6,000 years ago. First written language was created. Six, that's it. And if I may remind you, the airplane is only a little over 100 years old. There was no internet 50 years ago. No cell phone. So don't sit here and tell me that everything that, that can be done has been done. When we haven't been here for very long, there are dreams, there are, there are ideas and accomplishments that are waiting to be discovered. That are waiting for you. Helen Keller was once asked, what on earth would be worse than being born blind? She said, it would be so much worse to be born with sight, but no vision. Why can't we have cures for every disease known to man? Why can't we have clean water, food, education for every person on this planet? Why can't we have peace on this planet? Why do we have to die to go to heaven? The earth is already in space. We can have heaven right here, right now. Just a shift in this. Why not? Because somebody said it is impossible. It can't be done. I'll tell you this, there's never been a statue erected for a critic. Everybody tell you how to do it, they never did it. Moral of the story is, do you, be you. And be here now. Your dreams are possible. Stop obsessing over these celebrities, Kim Kardashian. Live your life. Step into your greatness. He said the average person dies at 25, but is buried at 75. You know what that means? Unless you figure it out. Don't let this negative world get to you. Don't let it win. Do not go where the path may lead, but go where there is no path and leave a trail. Are you all ready to step into your greatness? Hello! <laughs> if you have a pulse at all, I'm sure all of you are thinking right now, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? That's a short message, but it is very powerful. There is no time to waste, young people. I'm going to ask all of you to please give me your undivided attention, all you blue jackets in the audience. You all can reach your goals. You all can have the kind of life that you want to have. But it is going to require sacrifice and discipline. It is also going to include some real planning. And that plan may include a plan B, C, 
D, sometimes the, all the letters in the alphabet, but you can never give up. No matter what obstacles you encounter, you can never, ever give up. Good afternoon, Blue Jackets. I am so excited to be here. I hope that you are ready. I must take a moment, though, to, of course, thank the school system for inviting me, as well as Carriage Trade PR and Cecilia Russo Marketing, and, of course, thank my newest friend, David Russo, my partner in crime, for giving me such a wonderful introduction. I am certainly humbled to be back here amongst all these Blue Jackets at Savannah High School, and I really would like to humbly ask you all for your undivided attention for a few minutes. I promise there will be something in my message that you can take with you for the rest of your lives. So how are all of you all preparing for your future? Instead of dwelling on your past failures or disappointments, instead of talking about what you would have, should have done, why not develop a plan for success today and make things happen? Set your goals high and never be afraid to dream. And in the words of Langston Hughes, we all know them. I hope you know them. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is but a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams go, life is but a broken-winged bird that cannot fly, of course, but it also is like a barren field, frozen with snow. Success lies largely in our own hands. It means effort. It means having a definite aim and striving endlessly to achieve it. It certainly upsets me to see so many young people who are not taking advantage of all of the opportunities that are available to all of you every single day. You and even I have opportunities today that our parents could only dream about. But those dreams will not become realities by us sitting back, watching television. OK, right now, let me tell you something very seriously. You can watch TV, get your news, preferably from WTOC. But seriously, though, it, they won't come to you if you are standing on the street corners, posting everything about your life on social media. It requires effort. It requires determination. It requires perseverance. But we also must look within ourselves. We must divide, de define our strengths and weaknesses, develop a plan, and work hard every single day toward achieving our goals. We must become fearless. That means asking for opportunities when they aren't readily available for us. Whatever career you choose, you must reach out to people who are already in that industry. Send them an email or talk to them when you see them in your community. Savannah is a very small place. If you have any firsthand knowledge of what they're doing, don't be afraid to compliment them about what they're doing. All of us, you know, we're flattered when we see young people like you all who are smart and adventurous. And, and, and fearless. Tell us that you, you know what we're doing. Tell us that you've seen what we, we do. And show an interest in what we do. Ask for advice about how to break into the industry. You wouldn't believe how many young people I've met in the supermarket or at the mall or at a park when I've been walking around the park who I have given my personal cell phone number and they have never, ever called me. That is so upsetting. The secret to success is actually following through and going the extra mile. If you can't follow through with that, with someone who's willing to help you, I hate to say it, that probably means you're not going to follow through with much else in life. You have to show up. You have to give the extra mile, go the extra mile. Can you all do that? OK, I hope so. So here's the bottom line. And this is going to seem harsh to your generation, but I know another generation. And our parents actually told us the truth. If you think you're a winner, you'll be a winner. And if you think you're a loser, I hate to say it, you probably are going to be one. So here's what I believe is a loser and a winner. A loser has lots of problems. A winner considers those problems challenges. Losers talk about it all the time. Winners do it. Losers are part of the problem, while winners are part of the solution. Losers are quick to give up and make excuses for failure, while winners have other plans. Do you have the right attitude? Because attitude is what it's all about for this game of life. At an early age, I decided that I wanted to become a winner. You know, I grew up in a very, very small town. It's called Riceboro. Have you heard of it? Yes. It's not so far from Fort Stewart. It's about 11 miles from Fort Stewart. It's so small that guess what? There are only 750 people who live there today. Now, I heard you all have 607 people who go to Savannah High School. 
So just imagine looking at your school every day as you're out there on the field and the in the cafeteria, there are only a few more people in Riceboro, where I grew up, than who go to this whole school. And just three years ago, they got their first caution light. Now, I like to believe it's because, you know, they know how to drive down there. They don't need all those ugly pieces of metal hanging from the sky. But anyway, when I was just two and a half years old, my parents divorced, my father never looked back. So back in the 70s when I was growing up, that wasn't very common. People looked at my family as what they like to call a broken family. And they didn't expect much from those of us who were kids who came from uh, families that were, were being broken. So when I went into school in Hinesville, because there were no schools, there still aren't any schools in Riceboro, they looked at us very differently. We were from the country, we were poor, and we were black. But thanks, thank, thankfully for me, my parents, my mom, my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, all thought that we could do anything that we set our minds to. They supported us, they loved us, but the teachers, the others who knew that I came from that kind of environment, didn't expect nothing much from me. But my mom always told me I could be anything I set my mind to. She told me I had to get a good education. She told me I had to take my education seriously. She told me I had to set my goals high, and there were no excuses for failure. And that's the attitude I always remember. She told me I had to do my best on everything I set my mind to. Now granted, I didn't always get an A. I didn't always come in number one, but I learned to never give up. You have to adopt that attitude as well. And even if you are come from one of those alleged broken families, you can find male role models right there in your family. It may be an older brother, it may be a cousin, it may be an uncle, it may be a friend, it may be your pastor. Those people love and care about you. My grandfather was like Superman to me. He was like Superman to all of the children in the community. And he inspired me to always do my very best. So don't let anyone's idea of who you should be determine your future. And I feel like because of those, those perceptions that they gave me and the encouragement they gave me, I am just the luckiest person in the world. I feel like I'm like Tina Turner. She used to have a song a long time ago about living out your wildest dreams. I feel like I'm doing that. I've been truly, truly blessed. I want that for all of you all. All of you can really do that too, but you have to work hard. You can never give up, and you have to be very honest with yourself. I mean, you have to realize what you're truly capable of. When I was in, the, uh, throughout my life, I wanted to be a pediatrician, but I got a real reality check beginning when I was in eighth grade. I was a candy striper at Memorial Hospital. I was so excited because they put me on the pediatrics floor. Little did I know that was my first reality check about being a doctor. I always thought that doctors were truly miracle workers and they could save every single child. That summer, I spent crying and praying for strangers and realizing that doctors had some very tough decisions and all the time they couldn't save children. And I realized that maybe I wasn't gonna be the best doctor because I cried every time I was in the room when they gave a shot. And many of the terminally ill children passed away so that was already making me think that this may not be a good career for me. When I got to Savannah High, and realized back in the 80s, we went to the old Savannah High on Washington Avenue. I took a chemistry class, and I still have nightmares to this day about that periodic table. <laughs> chemistry was not my friend. I prayed so hard to finally make that seat. And that's when I realized maybe I wouldn't do so well in college science if I was doing so poorly in high school science. So I had some tough decisions to make. And I finally realized maybe I should follow what came easily for me because I always did well in English. I loved to write, I loved meeting people, and I started looking at a career in journalism. And it was the best decision I ever made in my life. I followed, we call it following our passion. So here it is 25 years later, I love what I do, and I will never make the money that a doctor makes in Savannah, but I think it was the best decision for me. So my challenge to all of you all is don't chase the mighty dollar. <laughs> Follow your passion. Find a job where you'd be just as happy going if they didn't pay you, and you would be very, very happy. As I look into this room with all of you wonderful young men and young women, I see very capable young people who can truly do anything they set their minds to. And many of you may not have been properly motivated yet to work as hard as you possibly can. And maybe you haven't been challenged to do the best that you can be. Don't waste one more second of your life waiting on someone else to push you to do your, do your very best. I need you to dig deep down inside yourself and challenge yourself to be the very best you can be. Be prepared though, 
once you start seeing what you're capable of doing, you will never, ever go back to just getting by. It's like turning on a valve and finding out there's a fire inside your belly. Once you see that you can do better, you will never go back to a life of just getting by. It is amazing, I promise you. You will turn on something that you've never experienced before. Because life is all about persevering, just keeping on doing your best. It's, it's a little bit at a time, and you will completely change your whole outlook on life. Did you know that a glacier takes about a year to move as far as we can walk in a few short minutes? Can you imagine that? But in that time, eventually, it carves out canyons and mountains and slaps up mountains as well. But it permanently changes the world just by keeping at it. So can you. We know that excellence is never an accident, but it is always a result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, skillful execution, and the vision to see obstacles as opportunities. But our excellence can certainly be derailed in the blink of an eye if we forget to think before we act. It happens every single day. I'm sure you all see it too for successful people, even older people like we are, you know, David and I being the oldest speaker hey, in the room. Hey. <laughs> Sometimes we see it when we watch Facebook and social media, people post a little bit too much out there and it comes back to haunt them. When you are applying for a job, I bet you never even realized that when, people, when you are applying for a job, companies actually check your social media and see who you really are. Everyone is smart enough right now to know that all of us will put on our finest suit, we'll get our hair done, young men will go and get their hair cut. If they'll come in there, if you have a bad attitude, you will borrow a nice person's personality for that day. You'll come in there, you'll be the perfect candidate for a job. They know that they want to get someone who's going to fit in with their team. They actually hire people who hack into your social media accounts. So don't be fooled that just because you can go on social media and set up all these privacy settings, that that's your book. Anything you put on the World Wide Web is public. There are people who are sophisticated enough to figure out exactly what you're doing. For instance, WTOC is owned by a company called Raycom Media. They own 64 television stations around the country. So just say you're applying for a job in Louisiana, and that <coughs> news director finds out that Maya wants to be a reporter. She comes in and has a fantastic interview. Everyone's impressed with her. And he finds out that, you know, she's cursing like crazy on her social media play page. And she has a lot of uh, drug use, pictures of her doing drugs. Why would you do that? I don't know, but people do it all the time. So he does a screen grab of that page. Guess what he can do with that? Send that to all the managers within Raycon Media. So now 64 bosses know that Maya isn't the great young lady she appeared to be when she applied for the job. So within a matter of minutes, 64 bosses around the country know that Maya might not be a good fit for their news department. So essentially, something she did in Savannah has blackballed her around the country. And it isn't just the workplace. It's colleges and universities, because you all write essays, you have interviews there. And just like here in Georgia, the, there's the Board of Regents and the University of Georgia system. Savannah State is connected to Armstrong Atlantic. It's connected to Georgia Southern. They're all connected. And they may see that you're doing something that doesn't fit into their culture on the campus. So be careful what you do because it will catch up with you. Even though you think that you're so private on social media and your mom and your aunt may not be able to find out, you can't block everybody. So just be very, very careful. And many of you, who's driving out here already? Watch your driving record. Many companies, when you work there, you have to be insured because you may have to drive a company car from time to time, even if you don't do it all the time. If they can't insure you because of that driving record, that could be the reason you don't get a job. So make sure, be careful. Everything you do, as my grandmother used to say, what you do in the dark shall come to light. And it could affect your future in many, many ways. So just watch what you do. Because we know that life, you know, is all about choices. I'm going to tell you one more quick story before I, come, before I close this afternoon about an elderly carpenter. He had done a wonderful job throughout his life. He was the best in the business. He worked for a company. He had helped the contractor win a lot of awards because he was wonderful, a leader in the industry. 
He decided it was time for him to, to retire. He'd worked for 30 years. He was looking forward to going fishing and golfing and spending time with his grandchildren. So he went to work one day and told the contractor, you know, I'm ready to retire. And the contractor was very sad to hear this because they had made a lot of money together throughout the years. So he told him, uh, well, instead of giving me two weeks or a month's notice, could you please just build one more house for me? So the guy said, you know, okay, I, I can do that. Because usually they, at this day and time, they're building houses within about five months. So what's two more months to work? So he went to work every day. He always showed up early. He would meet his crew at, at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. They'd go about the business of, of building a house. But pretty soon the crew realized this guy really, his heart wasn't into it. So we, and those of us who have been working for a long time, we call those people short shoppers. So day after day, he would show up and his heart really wasn't into it. He'd start taking shortcuts. So everybody could kind of look to the back and you'd see these door frames back here. And we call those angles that are exactly perfect, we call those right angles. And every carpenter learns when they first start working that before you cut a board, you measure the boards twice to make sure that everything is good before you cut the board because you want to make sure you don't waste the materials. Well, this man was so ready to quit that he would just kind of look up at the area. He would cut the board the first time. So instead of the doorway being completely straight, you'd see some, some doors, they were kind of leaning like this. So when he saw them leaning, he would just go up there and put a shorter piece of board on the leaning side. Then he'd put some caulk in there, you know, like in your bathroom. He'd squirt it in there and then sand it down and paint over it. So to those of us who aren't in the construction industry, we wouldn't know any better. But of course, people who know what they're doing, like the inspectors and his boss, they'd certainly know that something was wrong. And eventually that would cause problems with the house. But he was ready to go home. When they got onto the roof and started putting in the shingles, instead of putting four nails in the shingles, he put two, because he was ready to go home. Everything was substandard about this house. When builders put the garage onto the house, you know when you see that they're sealed tightly, they have a technique called flashing. That's what they do to make sure that there's not gonna be any leaks later on and the water won't start coming down the walls. This man did not have any time for that. So he told his crew, go on, you all do something else, I'll handle this, so when they turned their backs, he didn't do that process at all. He just put the tar on top, he was ready to go. So he called his boss one day and he said, you know, we're finished with the house. He said, okay, meet me there tomorrow at 7.30. We'll do the final walkthrough. He's standing out there in front of this pickup truck. He has the keys ready for the boss and he's just thinking, thank goodness, I'm gonna go fishing. I'm gonna do some work on my own house. I never have to come out here again. Life is good. His boss pulled up. They started going through for the final inspection. As soon as the boss walked into the house, he could see all these problems with the house and he was really surprised because John the carpenter had always done such a wonderful job. He just couldn't believe that this house was so pitiful. This looked like someone who was a beginning con carpenter who had never done work before. But he didn't say anything. He just kind of walked through and shook his hand here and there. He was pulling at things that weren't done properly. They walked all the way through the house and he went back outside and said, you know, John, I'm just so sad to see you leave. I, I will never find another contractor like you to take your place. You've done an excellent job. Thank you so much. And John said, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm just so ready to go. My grandson has a lot of things we need to catch up on. And they had a little small talk. And so he looked at him and he said, you know, um, I'm going to miss you. And he said, yes, sir, you know, it's been good working with you. He said, I wish you could train some of our people. He said, no, 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 I don't want to do any training now. My time is up. He said, okay, well, thank you so much, John. And he got the keys, and he gave John the keys. And John said, what's this for? He said, oh, this is your house. He said, what do you mean? He goes, this is my gift to you. For 30 years of amazing service, I wouldn't have made it without you. He said, this is my gift to you. Thank you so much. So here John, all of a sudden, he's shocked, but most importantly, he's embarrassed. If he would have only known he was building his house, he would have built so much differently. So such it is with all of us. Often we put in less than our best every single day. So no matter what career you choose in life, we are all carpenters because we are building the life, the house that we will live in ultimately. You are a carpenter. Each day we hammer a nail, we place a board, we erect a wall. It has been said that life is a do-it-yourself project. Your attitudes and the choices that you make 
build the house that you will live in tomorrow. So always build wisely. Remember, when you make the right choices, the sky is the limit. That is the most important lesson I hope that I, have, I will leave with you all today. It is my sincere hope that all of you will become everything you have ever dreamed you will be. This is your life. As long as you prepare yourself by believing in yourself, studying, studying hard, listening to your teachers and parents, always doing your best, making good choices, respecting yourself and others, accepting responsibility for your actions. Let me say that one again. Accepting responsibility for your actions. Can you say it with me now? Accepting responsibility for your actions and caring for others. The sky really is the limit. You are in charge of your future. To get ahead, you must put others first. A true leader is generous and grateful. Don't allow the desire for material things to control you. Look at it as a resource to improve the world. One great writer said, service is the rent we pay to be living. It is the very purpose of life and not something to do in your spare time. Believe you have the power to achieve anything you desire. After all, in the end, it doesn't matter how much money you have made or how much recognition you have received. What really matters is the difference you have made in this world. I want you to make your mark on this world so that the world will know that you all were here. Superstar Beyonce Knowles said it best in front of the United Nations in 2012 in her stirring rendition of the song she calls, I Was Here. So what will you do? From this day on, I challenge all of you to be so strong that nothing will disturb your peace of mind. To talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. To think only the best, to work only for the best, and expect only the best. To be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. To forget the mistakes of the past and press on to greater achievements of the future. To give so much time to improving yourself that you have no time to criticize others. To be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. To think well of yourself and to proclaim this back to the world, not in large, loud words, but in great deeds. To live in the faith that the whole world is on your side, so long that you are the, true to the best that is in you. So Blue Jackets, if you are ready to change this world and live out your wildest dreams and step into your greatest and your greatness, stand up and give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> for your time and attention today. Let's go out and change the world. Robin, well, come on over here. We're gonna ask you a few extra questions here before we let everybody go. And we've got, we've got a few both from Maya, and uh, we, we've got uh, a couple questions I wanna ask you as well, and then uh, for Jonathan as well, we're gonna get some from you. I guess I gotta hold this one very close to me as well. The first question I wanna ask you is this. This is a bit, Pointed. So I hope you don't mind. Are you approachable? <laughs> it's an actual question, and I, I, I think it's a legitimate one because I think people look at certain careers and certain career paths, and they think, I don't know that I'm going to go up to that person because they are here, and I feel here. Yeah. Tell me your your thoughts on that. Uh, yes, I, I am, and I think most of us are. And that is a good question. Um, most people, it's interesting, anybody can approach me. I, I, I enjoy talking to people when I meet them. Um, I take, I've taken, the funniest thing is I've taken, the funniest picture I've taken was in a ladies room at the movie theater. So yes, if you see me anywhere, de please talk to me. Oftentimes it's very uh, scary when I hear people talking to me, but when I turn around to speak to them, they, they act like, they aren't talking to me. So yes, please, um, we are just like all of you. We get dressed and put on our shoes one at a time. And I enjoy talking to people and, and I would be happy to talk about anything you'd like to talk about. Um, and you can send me an email, I will answer. Sometimes it does take a little bit longer because we do get an awful lot of email. So please, if you see me or anyone, David, any of us, 
please come up and say hello. We will be happy to help you in any way that we can. Sometimes we don't always have the answer. Often, because we work three to midnight, people will catch me at one o'clock in the afternoon. I'm on my way to work, and they think that I know all of the news, even when I'm on vacation. So sometimes I don't know all the answers right away, but I will do my best to find out the answer. Thank you for that. Maya, you had a question. Would you say that your physical appearance is equally as important as your skills as a news anchor? Oh, definitely, definitely. People always expect you to be camera ready. And, but I've always been like that. My grandfather, who was born in 1906, always believed that you should never leave the house unless you were presentable. So we were always taught, not that you had to have on a suit, but you should look presentable. Your hair should be combed, your clothes should be ironed, and you should, you should not look like you were rumpled and tumbled. So yeah, that's very important. Christopher, what question did you have? Who was your greatest motivation in going into your field of broadcasting? Uh, back then, um, I it was really ex excited about seeing Barbara Walters and Carol Simpson, they were the two women who were on network news. And do you even know who they are? Okay. <laughs> I have to ask because they were on TV back in the 70s and 80s. And Barbara Walters, well, both of them are still on now, but not on network television anymore. Dawn, looking back at your public education, what subjects do you think, whether you knew it at the time or not, prepared you best for the career choice you made? Of course, English, and I was very lucky in that my mother and my, girl, and my aunt were both English teachers as well. That was also very difficult because my mother, who's sitting right there, was like living with the grammar drill sergeant. You too. <laughs> so often I sat home quietly because she would say, she would correct me so much that I would get frustrated as a kid, and she would say, if you are not going to speak properly, do not speak at all. I knew I know that was preparation for what I would do in life. I love you and thank you now. <laughs> Christopher, give me a second question for Paul. With the internet taking over the world news, do you still see TV news succeeding? In the future? Definitely, always. But we have to adapt with it. That's why we have a website. That's why we are on social media as well. And we try to definitely respond to you all as quickly as you ask us questions. So all of us have fan pages. We post stories there. And uh, when you ask us questions, we try to respond as quickly as, as, as possible. But we can't ignore it. And um, we look and see what you all are talking about. And if it is legitimate, you'll see stories that come from social media all the time. Let me do a follow-up question here. How jealous are you of everyone else out here because they know social media and they know that internet so much better than we do? Extremely jealous because we are at a serious learning curve and we've been pushed onto it. And honestly, we're not so happy about it, but we can't stay in the dark ages because that's where our industry is going. And um, we, that's why there are a lot of jobs for young people like you all. We have a whole digital team and they are all in their 20s. and. They are teaching the older people, and um, yeah, it, it's rough. So if you are interested in journalism, there's a lot of non-traditional jobs for journalists now. So if we have whole teams of young people who are leading the way and telling us how to do it better, and we're looking to you guys to keep us relevant. Maya, what question did you have next? Um, what helped you more, on the field job training or your journalism courses at SAM? Well, actually, I was very lucky. I went to Howard University and it had an excellent journalism program. So we had, all, all of my instructors had been network news reporters. So you need to be very careful when you choose the school you go to to make sure it has that kind of program. And they also had a television station. So we were the public broadcasting station for the DC metro area. So we were doing stories every day that were, now it wasn't commercial, but we were getting that uh, practice every single day. And that helps. And also having those people who had that wealth of knowledge, so they were telling you, in addition to the, the book, they were telling you real world experiences and how you should dress, how you should speak, things that you would look out for when you got into the industry. So it wasn't such a culture shock that I see a lot of people have 
when they come in and they're like, the book tells you a lot, but the real world, there's no, uh, no preparation for what's going to go on with the real world. You're just looking from a textbook. So it was really, with me, I had a unique experience because I had those kind of professors. Dawn, high school or college, did you work while you were in school in either one? And how did that prepare you, regardless of the career choice you made? I did work very briefly in high school. Um, I went out on my own and got my little job at the Crispy Chick without letting my mom know. And I, she was very angry at me because I got the job. Uh, and I worked there for three weeks um, because uh, I thought that I was helping because my mom was a single parent. And she informed me that her job was to take care of me and my job was to do well in school. But she would allow me to do it since I took it upon myself to get this job. So one night she showed up to pick me up from school, from uh, work, and I worked with the one, it's, it was it's, it's getaway in uh, LaRoque right across from Savannah State at that time, and I was, I was, I was much thinner in high school. I was 115 soaking wet, and she showed up and I was mopping with a mop that was taller than I was, and she said, you put in your two week notice, you will not come back here again. So I did, and that was, the only time that I worked in high school. Now I will tell you, for some people it works, for others it may not be a good idea because if you are not a very strong student, I can honestly see that your job, your grades may slip. And then a lot of employers abuse high school students. They work too late, they don't have the time to, do, to get their homework done. So you, it really depends on the student. So uh, if you don't have to, and I know some situations you do have to, it can be an interesting juggling situation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Maya, what other question? Um, is being an active volunteer a part of your job? It's not a part of my job, but I've always done that because I just came from a family where my grandparents, my, my mom, my whole family, everybody always volunteered. So because I always saw that, I've always done it. So I've always volunteered helping nonprofits and I do my own thing with young ladies, so that's just who I am. We are encouraged at the station to volunteer and host fundraisers and things like that, though. Dawn, and I mentioned it in the introduction, talking about how to get what you want and keep what you want. You've got to give some of that back. What does, what does volunteering, what does providing support to those less fortunate to you do for you personally that, regardless of the station or your bosses or anyone else, what does it do for you personally? Uh, it's, it's hard to explain, you know, the intangible, a feeling. It's, it's, to me, it's so important to find organizations that are doing the good work that you believe in. I think that keeps you going because we do have a job that is very demanding. It takes so much out of you, and many of you will never understand the hours that we put in and the demands once we're there. So if you find an organization that you truly believe in, that you're passionate in that as well, it, 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 it really gives you that extra lift and keeps you going. Because even though I anchor three newscasts and there are other things that I do, in that moment when I may have a dinner break, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm woofing down a salad, chicken or whatever, and I may be writing on something to help that organization because it's not the free time it, it, it inspires you, it motivates you, because you know that you're helping people in the community who can need an, uh, an extra hand. And sometimes it's also a talent that you already have, so you're just adding to it. You're refining that writing skill or that speaking skill or making a basket or whatever, or telling them how they can improve on what they're doing. And it is even hard for you because it comes naturally. The three newscasts, the reporting, the radio, the teases. I mean, we could go on and on. Yeah. And then, of course, the newsroom restaurant where we all eat at yes. our desks every night. Christopher. How would, you, how would you advise young people like ourselves to plan for our future? Well, I, I think a lot of it I touched on, you know, with, with my speech, but the most important thing is to write down your goals um, and keep them in front of you, but also if you are, say you want to become, because you all want to become journalists. Is that, I did hear that, right? Um, music, I don't know much about the music industry, but there are a couple of, aren't there a couple of studios still in town? There's one. One? There's a music studio in town? I would say go out there. 
talk to the young man who, who, who runs it and say, I'm interested in doing what you do when I grow up. Do you have any tips for me? And I bet you he'd be flattered to meet you. And he could probably tell you how he got into the business, some of the people he met. Um, I would ask him if you could come and shadow him. And this is for all of you all, whatever you're interested in doing. See if you can come and shadow that person on the job on the end. And that, what I mean by that shadowing is just going in there and seeing if he will let you come and spend the day with him. So you can see if it's really what you want to do. Because oftentimes, we have these, these uh, ideal views of what the job really is. And if you go in there for one or two days, you're like, well, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> it will be a real reality check. And that will be the beginning of knowing what you want to do. You can also Google a lot of these jobs and see what they do every day. And this, you'll know, too, what colleges you need to look at, because those who have strong programs, that really helps you. And when you are having the whole scholarship now, it's important, no matter what field you go into, to make sure you keep those grades up. Because another reason I'm jealous of your generation, there was no hope, that kind of hope, when I was growing up. My, you know, I, I wrote a million essays trying to get scholarships so that I could go to school, and, and my mom worked so hard to put me through school. Here's a web address I want you all to write down. Um, does anybody have paper or cell phone? Pull out the, you're allowed to pull out the cell phones right now. <laughs> MySchooly.com, and that is spelled M-Y-S-C-H-O-L-L-Y. Dot com. Let's go again. M Y S C H O L L Y dot com. That is a hub. It costs 99 cents. But on that website, you will find access to scholarships for whatever stage in life you are, whether you are a graduating senior or a sophomore or junior in college. Quite a few people have used it, they've had great success but you need to keep your grades up. That's a good avenue. But keep in touch with people who are in the industry. They will tell you some steps you can take. You're gonna to need to write some essays for scholarships. Nobody just wants to stand in the street and give you money now. They have to know that you're gonna do well once you get there. Dawn, thank you so much for your candor. All of you out there, future entrepreneurs and business owners and teachers and presidents, thank you for your undivided attention as well. We appreciate you coming to uh, to this and, and, and seeing John and hopefully we got something out of it.